you could get the door going. Well, good morning. We are a couple minutes late, and so uh, still going to give people time to get on live. And um, and if you're watching this by recording, want to again uh, say thanks. And I hope that um, for for everyone um, that the Bible study, the opportunity to be together in God's Word, um, is something that's helping us both grow, challenging us as far as really responding in obedience to Jesus. Um, the focus of the study on Revelation has been to, to hear the message of Revelation. And, and behind that, my, my conviction that um, it is one of the most hopeful books that we have in the Bible. Um, hopeful because it reminds us to lift our eyes and to focus on Jesus. Hopeful because it tells us that the end of the story is is sure, affirmed, um, Jesus wins, and if we put our faith in him, we will overcome and we will be victorious. A um, couple things just as far as encouragement, if you um, have not yet uh, taken the survey, uh, there is um, a, a link to a survey uh, both on the Facebook page as well as um, on the website. Um, if you didn't receive an email, I want to invite you to um, give your email to the office so that we can uh, send information to you and you can get that. This is one of the things that we have been, um, this survey has been one of the things that we've really been uh, encouraging in the last week for people to do. Uh, it gives us information. Uh, one of the things that I experience is that, you know, we it's, it's easy as far as, creating with the format of being able to speak out into um, our congregation, our church community, but it's not so much a dialogue. You know, one of the ways that we're doing the Bible study is you're invited to share comments um, with one another as well as ask questions with me, but we all know there's a big difference between um, being on whatever device we're, we're watching, what's being streamed, and the gift of being in person. And, um, and so yeah, the survey represents um, really a concerted effort to try to, to start getting some feedback um, just to see how things are going. Um, and um, if you haven't taken it, it, you know, it takes about, the average person does it in about seven minutes, um, probably ends up answering about 30 questions. And, um, and it covers everything from, you know, if your your experience of Sunday morning worship via online to um, your understanding about uh, our reopening plan uh, gives opportunities for people who are missing out on things. If you haven't received a phone call from a deacon, if you um, aren't in a life group, it allows opportunity to be able to engage in that way. Gives feedback even on preferences and if you're um, participating in some of the, the Bible studies, um, lectures, worship night, uh, meditations, um, all of which is giving us more information to help us understand. Um, so we're about five minutes in. I've given you that introduction. Um, if you're joining with us live, welcome. And uh, let me pray for us. And then um, we're going to launch into today's discussion. Loving Heavenly Father, give praise for this day. And um, thank you for the beauty of the sun and the blue skies. And um, that if we were able to get out this morning, that um, it feels good. Um, lift up this day, especially for anybody who's working outside or for people who um, are homeless um, or um, are struggling as far as just having cooling. It's going to be hot today, so we pray your blessings and protection and care for, for all of us, and especially those um, that will be most affected by it. Thank you for your word. Thank you for um, 
preparing our hearts and our minds um, by giving us promises, by calling us to faith, um, and by giving us reasons to be assured and to have hope that no matter what we see with our eyes, we understand more because of your word. We can put on revelation glasses. We can look at the world through the lens of the New Testament and the entire scriptures and, um, and have real reason and confidence to believe that your story of the world is not only the best story of the world, but the true story of the world. So bless us today as we continue to seek to grow and to understand both the book of Revelation and your call on our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Reminder that if I um, encourage you to prayer to share prayer requests um, with one another, and then if, um, if there's something that you'd like me to pray for um, at the end of the Bible study, just go ahead and post that, and, um, and we will pray at the end. So, we've been laying a foundation to, um, to build our understanding about the biblical teaching of, of the end. We, we're not, just so you know, we're, we're not doing this comprehensively. Um, there's lots of things that we could spend more time with and we could get into discussions about specific issues and different scriptures, for example. You know, understanding heaven, understanding... Uh, hell, understanding, judgment. We're, we're going to look at more of those about what Revelation specifically has to say. But there's, there's other data, um, other texts, other scriptures that we could draw upon to help answer those questions. And this isn't a class on eschatology, it's on biblical revelation. Um, uh, it's particularly the revelation um, of John. But I, I wanted to give you this background and this foundational material because Revelation itself um, is very significant in helping form the different schools of thought that different Christians um, end up kind of identifying with about understanding these large questions about what happens at the end, how, when will Jesus come back, how will final judgment um, work itself out, um, what's the order of things? And, um, and so, and this is the part where we get these different schools that are called premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, and then we have the issue of um, the rapture. And, um, and so I wanted to give you a foundation so that you, one, become familiar with those names, you understand those schools of thought, so that as you continue to grow, as you continue to read, as you continue to study, um, you read a book, um, and you can begin to go, oh, this person's coming out of this school of thought. Um, you know, let me listen to their ideas. They, they may have, you know, their own unique position within that school, but it's more coming from over here. And then the other part is, is that we're trying to listen to Revelation. And one of my principles, and this is just... Um, Historic um, orthodoxy and evangelicalism is God's word to us was first of all God's word to them. And so we, we God spoke this word into history, uh, addressing um, specific situations and specific people. And yet, in the, in the wonder of God's providence and his wisdom, he knew that this was a word for us as well. And he's spoken it for us. It's, you know, along with Hebrews, it's a living word. So we have these scriptures. We, we first begin, what did it mean to them? Its primary meaning is about what it meant to them. And then we have to list it, step back and say, okay, now what does it say to us? Um, and Revelation, because it's dealing with the end, um, and we're called to be watchful, well, it, it has a whole bunch to say to us and inform and us. And, and then this is the part about giving us hope, about realizing um, when we focus on the end in Scripture, often the major concern is not the day or the hour, but it is about building in us, as disciples of Jesus Christ, um, faith, hope, um, perseverance that we will hold on in the midst of hard times, 
And so more of a preparedness than, than actually um, trying to figure out the day or the hour. That, again, is something I've been trying to emphasize throughout here. And, um, and so we're coming, and today we're going to at least begin our discussion about talking about more particularly these schools of thought, amillennialism, postmillennialism, premillennialism. And um, what I'm going to begin with is I'm going to I'm going to just read for you Revelation 20. We're we're not going to be doing a, a dive into trying to really hear this yet. Um, we still have a little bit more scripture passage to deal with because we also have the story of the rider on the white horse that we haven't looked at, and, and, and I'm going to make an argument when we get there, this is a unit. But I want you to have a little bit of a background, um, because I'm going to give you a little bit of a history of interpretation, and I'll even explain why I'm doing this. But, uh, Revelation 20, beginning in verse 1. Now, one of the things we've learned is, is you know, in the Revelation, I think it's best not to view this as what happens next, but what did John see next, um, and leave open the possibility that this may not just all be chronological. But not everybody's done that, and that's going to lead to some of its divisions and schools of thought. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key in the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark or the, on their foreheads or their hands. Now, just a little bit of appreciation. You know, you read through the whole Revelation and, and, and these visions unfold. And John's already covered some of this material for us. We, we, we know these players now. We've heard this story already. And um, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Megagog, to gather them for battle in number. They are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But the fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire, a burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been, and they will be tormented day and night. And then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and the sky, fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And... Um, there's a lot there, and it, I read you a little bit more than the Millennial Kingdom, and it's taking us even further, but this is all of the stuff. Now, what do we do with this? Um, because, you know, if, if, if we don't read this symbolically, and we read this just as kind of telling us narratively the story of what happens... Now, we could be caught up because we could just make the assumption what, what came just before was the last battle and Jesus on the white horse and, and, and the end, it would seem. But then we see this next and we see the serpent getting bound and um, Jesus reigning on earth 
And those who didn't get the mark of the beast and who go and who trust in him, they are part of what's called this first resurrection. And they reign with him for this thousand year period. And, and then Satan gets unbound and, you know, and, and gathers. And then, and then there seems to be an, another battle, which we thought we had already heard the last battle. Now, this is the part where everybody in this should have some humility about, okay, this is, this is a little challenging. Now, history, uh, history of interpretation. So, one of the things, question, yes. Yes, Revelation 26 mentions first resurrection. Is there another resurrection? The question is, Revelation chapter 20, verse 26, verse six. Mentions, what? Verse 6. Verse 6. Yeah. So, chapter 20, verse 6 mentions the first resurrection. Is there another resurrection? Well, the other resurrection is the second resurrection, and then, which happens later at the end when there's final judgment, where all the dead are called back, and then they stand before the throne. But Jesus got raised, and um, and so we're working within Revelation and, and what it has to say. So you come and, and you're trying to allow this text and its witness and this vision to speak with integrity. And so in one so and to give a little broader context to answer this. So remember that in the Old Testament you have some passages um, like Isaiah 53, um, Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones, I think it's Ezekiel 37. Um, where you, where you begin to have the seeds that, that end up growing into full-blown trees that we now rest in the shade and take cover in, the hope that's given because we know this, of this idea of resurrection. And, um, but in the Old Testament, what you basically get is, is you, it, you get a very simple understanding there's there's going to be the day of the Lord. And and history is moving in a direction. Um, since the fall, things have not always happened on earth um, according to God's um, perfect will. Um, and instead, he's permitted, allowed sin and Satan to have reign and way on the earth. But the, the trajectory is, is that a day is coming the day of Yahweh, the day of I am, the day of the Lord. And on that day, it's going to be a day of justice and a day of goodness and a day of salvation. And really the Exodus is just a physical prefigurement of this. And all sin, death, evil will be dealt with. That, that's the basic picture in the Old Testament. And the resurrection became a day of the Lord, end times, this is it final judgment sort of thing. And that was the Jewish hope in Jesus' day. And then the most surprising thing happened because this claimant to be the Messiah, which is all part of the day of the Lord and the anticipation of hope and when God dealt with his enemies, Jesus declared and then he was put to death. And then three days later, just as he predicted, numerous times he was raised from the dead. And instead of resurrection now just being a single event, the overall picture that we have in the New Testament is that there's a first resurrection, which was Jesus' resurrection, and a second resurrection, which will happen when he comes back, which the rest of us will be raised. And if we read through the rest of the New Testament documents, other than Revelation and chapter 20 here, that's basically what we're picturing. But here, you know, it's... And, and we sh what we really should be doing is we should be asking the question, wh how, what's going on? How do we picture this? Now, what I've been trying to train us to do is not what happens next, but to, what did John see next? And don't jump to the conclusion that what happens in Revelation 20 immediately ha follows what we saw in Revelation 19. Um, and so, 
Not everybody's done that, though. And, um, and as Christians, this is the part where, especially when it's a hard passage like this, we're going to take time, we're going to listen, um, and we're going to listen across the centuries. And, you know, the goal is, is to try to get to the best reading of the text. Um, you know, we believe that there's truth that's being communicated in Revelation 20. And the closer that we get to understanding that truth, the more that truth will really help us live in obedience and response to what Jesus wants for us. Um, now, I, I think I mentioned the joke about pan-millennialism last Monday. And let me remind you of that. We have these three major schools of thought. Premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism. People get very heated about this. People can get very judgmental about this. Um, you know, because, and and I'll and I'll try to. I'm, I'm hoping that you'll have a clear understanding of even why some of that happens. To, um, but you know, if if you're not in the school of thought and you're in another school of thought, sometimes people will wonder if you're really a good Christian or not, or a Bible-believing Christian, because how can you possibly reject what so clearly this is saying? And, um, you know, and that's where one of my cautions is. is I, it, it, yeah, I, it's not so clear what it's all saying, because we're asking questions like this. First resurrection. Second resurrection. Okay, so I know Christ was raised. Is, is that the first resurrection? But this, this seems different. Now, one school of thought, which would take this more symbolically, like we do with most of all of the apocalypse and the apocalyptic visions, is you would say, well, this binding of Satan, this first resurrection, this time where in some way, the, the, the nations are, are not being maybe completely deceived. This is probably how you would interpret this. It is the church age. And, um, and the first resurrection refers to the fact that those who don't have the mark of the beast, we are spiritually alive with Christ because his spirit resides in us. And so we, we are not really children of perdition or judgment or wrath. And we're really not going to die we're going to go and be with the Lord in a better state. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. So we go back and we can look at the early church fathers and, um, you know, and realize that, um, you know, we're a little bit of a loss. We're not exactly sure, but the best evidence seems to be that Revelation was probably written during the reign of Domitian, 92 to 95. John is a political prisoner on the island of Patmos. This means the destruction of the temple has already happened. And so, so when they're reading Revelation, when they're hearing other information from Daniel, for example, in the Olivet Discourse, that, that, that there's probably some sense of clarity, okay, so some of what Jesus has said has already happened, but not all of it has happened. And, they, and you've got these questions about when will the end come? When will Jesus return? And, and, and those questions have been asked numerous times because through the entire New Testament, after Jesus has been ascended, there is a, there is a sense nobody knows the day or an hour and the imminence that Jesus could come back at any time and... Um, you know, the gospels to be spread to the ends of the earth. We know that's part of it, but the church is actively at work looking to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, probably with the highest sense of anticipation that, you know, this this is needs to happen so for Jesus to return. And then the sooner it takes place, the better, because when Jesus returns, everything will be set right. And so, you know, woohoo! But... Um, We have documents as far as the way that early church fathers interpreted the revelation. But the other thing to know is this, is that not everybody in the early church actually have, had the opportunity to read the revelation. The, the way that, the, that 
the documents of the New Testament originally got disseminated um, was was not this top-down organization that we could see. We, we trust in God as far as his providence of doing that, so that sense it would be top-down. But um, very early on, the four Gospels were joined together. Um, and we think probably sometime early in the, in the um, second century um, AD, you know, like in the 110s or, or around there, we have evidence that the four Gospels had been joined together and, and they were part of what churches around the Mediterranean, around the known world, the Christian, the Greco-Roman world where the Gospel was beginning to spread, that those four Gospels um, were part of the gift of God, that these were God's words telling Jesus' story it was significant to the early church that there were four Gospels. Um, this is the story of the world and the story of Jesus for the whole world. And just as the world has four corners, there are four Gospels, and this becomes foundation on which we stand. This is part of the tradition that Paul talked about. The other thing that happened very early on in, in this period is that um, the, the letters of Paul were collected um, you know, we're right at the place where the technology of a book over a scroll is beginning to emerge. And so, remember that with the scroll, you have a limited amount of space. The scroll could be about 33 feet longer, any longer than that, and it would get too heavy and it would break. And so it, it, it kind of dictated as far as if you're going to think about writing, unless you wanted to make two volumes like Luke did with Luke and Acts. You're going to you're going to keep it to no more than 33 feet. But right in this time period, there's beginning of codexes, where now there's pieces of paper or vellum, and they're, and they're being bound together with binding, and, and this creates a new opportunity. And so right in this period of time, the four Gospels get brought together into a book. And then the letters of Paul, and we think the letter of Hebrews as well, gets brought together. And we, and you know, you may ask the question, how do we know this? Well, we ha we have manuscript evidence for this, and we also have some testimonies as far as the early church. But but this is also where, in the story of the dissemination, um, you know, this the churches spread as numerous churches were planted, and then um, you know, and whoever you know, whoever is worth planting. You need to pass on the tradition. You need to found them in God's word. And so there would be the Old Testament scriptures. And then there was this recognition that the apostolic witness and writings were God's words for us as well. They're passing on the, the tradition of Jesus. And so you get, you get those gospels. And you get the letters of Paul. And then you get some of these other documents. And, um, and, and you know, and and different churches would have them, and they would make copies, and then there would be relations with other churches, and they would share these things, and there was, you know, it was expensive, but, you know, this was God's word, and they would do it. So, you know, over the first couple of hundred years, before the process of the canon, where we then identified officially the list, there's earlier lists that we have, the Mercurian um, list, um, Irenaeus of Lyons, 180 AD, creates a list um, of biblical books, most of which, you know, uh, are match up with the New Testament. And, and then we have these second generation um, books like the Didache. So, a little background. We have information about how some of the people in the early church understood the Revelation. Revelation was, was one of the more less leaned on books in the early church period. But people read it, some people had it, people recognized that this was from John the Apostle, that's how the tradition held, and, um, and so this, this is scripture. And, but, remember this, apocalyptic literature 
which Revelation is a letter of prophecy and apocalypse, was, 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 was a Jewish genre. And it became a Jewish Christian genre, and we have some examples of early Jewish Christian apocalypses um, along with the Revelation. Um, but the church primarily spread into the Greco-Roman world among the Romans and the Greeks, and not among the Jews. And, um, and so what ended up happening is, is that in the early church, uh, there were very few examples of apocalyptic literature that m most people who were studying Revelation or reading it could lean on. And so, you know, they knew Daniel and they knew the Old Testament, but there were, but, you know, this, this is, this is even different from Daniel. It's bigger, it's more elaborate, there's more structure. Um, and so, even then, people struggled with it and didn't always know quite what to do with it. And in the early church, you can basically it, sit there and kind of say, really, there's kind of two camps and, and, and we could make that same sort of a division. I talked about this before. And basically, the two camps were this. The, the one camp read Revelation, read it as scripture, and said, okay, we've got more information here. And this is the only place that we find this information. But their working assumption was this. You read Revelation from beginning to end chronologically. This in some way is laying out a map and timeline of the things that will happen with a little bit of an understanding probably that the story of the beast swallowing the woman, but we can't always assume that. And I have not spent the time as far as reading everything on the early church and, and the way they interpreted Revelation um, to, to say that conclusively. That, but they, they primarily read it from beginning to end, you know, beginning in chapter four and until you get to the end as this just being one chronological story. And so we get the story of, of Jesus riding on the white horse, overcoming. And then, obviously, then in chapter 20, that comes next. And this, in the early church, it was called childism. Um, and this is from the Greek word for a thousand. And, and childism was the idea that, okay, so now, because of Revelation, what we know is that there was Jesus' first coming, and then he's going to come back, and there's going to be this battle, and he's going to set up a kingdom for a thousand years, and he's going to rule on earth for a thousand years, and Satan is going to be bound for this thousand year time. Even though it looked like the last battle was what happened with the rider on the white horse, it actually is not the last battle. It's a little more complicated, and what's going to happen is, is that there's going to be this first resurrection of people, probably, and you'll get different interpretations of this, but probably people who you know don't have the mark of the beast, but but you know they were martyrs, and they get they they get raised, and they raise with Christ, and they don't, you know, they won't die now during this time, and so there's a group of people who are walking around in resurrected bodies, different from. The rest of humanity that Jesus is ruling over, and 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 then Satan's going to be unbound for a time. He's going to deceive all of these nations, even though Jesus is present on earth, sitting on his throne. And then there will be now the actual last battle sort of thing. And then there'll be final judgment and it will work itself out. And we believe in God's word. We believe that he's given us truth. And, and, and we've made the assumption that we read everything chronologically. And this is the way that the majority of early church fathers ended up reading the Revelation. Um, but not everybody read the Revelation that way. Other people said, no, no, um, this is symbolic, and it's going to be um, that this, this is representative of the church age, 
And, and really, the pattern is what we expect it to be. Jesus' is first coming, and then there's this time in between, and the thousand years kingdom is, is going to be something that happens right now while Jesus is, is, is sitting on the throne in heaven, and he's ruling spiritually through his church on earth. Um, when, when the church, when Christianity became the official view of Christendom, you began to have a little more people who started leaning in this direction of saying, oh, look, now Christianity is now in the seat of power with the Roman Empire. So it starts to make a little bit more sense. Maybe we, we see this working out in some way. Um, don't be surprised that in church or in the history of, of Europe, um, if about a thousand years after the time that Constantine declared um, Christianity the official religion, that you began to have millennial movements of believing that the thousand years has, has happened and Jesus is going to be coming back any time now. Why? Because, well, he ruled the world for a thousand years through um, his church. And that thousand years is up and Satan is going to be unbound and it's all going to be done. And, and, and you have some of that expectation in the 1400s in Europe. But we're still back at the early church period and, and you kind of have those two those two separate views, um, and you know, and it's it's fairly similar to where we are today. Amillennial, postmillennial would be the more symbolic reading, and then premillennialism would match the childistic reading. And and what you'll see there is the key is the assumption that you make about the nature of the book of Revelation, and how you read the entire book. Do I read it chronologically? Or, or do I read it more symbolically and Revelation 20 isn't trying to tell me what happens after this battle and Jesus setting up, but it's something different. Um, and, it, you know, so we work ourselves forward and, um, and then things develop a big development as far as interpretation happened during the, the um, Renaissance, which then led into the Reformation. You know, realize that, you know, for a large part of the period between the, the, um, the fall of the Roman Empire and, and it split into the Greek-speaking half, which became the Byzantine Empire, and the Latin-speaking half, which became the remnants of the Holy Roman Empire, um, and and what we know is mostly Europe. Um, Greek was lost for the Western part of the church, and it meant that most people were reading the Bible um, through a, the Jerome's translation in Latin, and not even in the original. Um, they. They weren't familiar with apocalyptic literature other than the examples in scripture. They didn't probably have any. I mean, maybe maybe some of the great libraries had a couple different copies of some of the examples of Jewish apocalypse, but these wouldn't have been things that people would have studied. And so, you know, it, there's not a lot of development in, in, in how the revelation was being interpreted during this time period. We get to, and, but when we get to the Reformation, it, out, out, coming out of the Renaissance, um, you, you know, significant people in this, um, Erasmus of Rotterdam, uh, Luther and Calvin, um, because they went with the rena re Renaissance, which was back to the sources, Ad Fontes was this great um, catchphrase capturing the time, they were, they were beginning to learn Greek again. They were beginning to learn Hebrew again. They were going back to, you know, those original documents and able to read, not through translation. And, and, if, and if you haven't heard this before, you know, our modern English translations are absolutely fabulous. I mean, I mean they, they're, they're, you know, they're translated typically by, by committees and they go through large vetting processes and you have all of these experts who devoted their life to these sort of things. And, you know, and we have the capability as humans of being able to translate from one language to the other 
And while some things are going to be lost, the major message won't be. And um, the analogy is, is that, you know, it, when you go back and you read in Greek or Hebrew, it's a little bit like the difference between watching something in black and white and watching it on color, like a color TV. In black and white, you're going you're gonna to see and you're going to hear and you're going to understand but you might miss a little bit of the nuance that if you could see it in color, it would stand out for you a little bit more. And going back into the originals allows you to do that. So in the Reformation period, they begin to go back into the originals and they begin this process. Now, in the Reformation, Luther, first generation, great reformer, second generation, Calvin, great reformer, Calvin was was um, was probably the most prolific writer of the Reformation, though Luther wrote a lot. But especially when it came, look, Calvin was famous and and actually quite rare. You can read Calvin's commentaries today and still have much value with them. Um, and you know, while they lack some of the the details that some of our modern commentaries will have, they, he was a, he was a very good reader of Scripture. He knew his Greek, he knew his Hebrew, um, he paid attention to the words, he studied the scriptures. Um, he wrote a commentary on almost every book of the Bible. But one of the books that he skipped, one of, I think, two, is Revelation. And he just, he kind of admitted, I don't know what to do with this. And so he never wrote a, a commentary on it. Um, and, and, you know, this is part of it, is, is that you kind of get this, that, that you know, most people struggled with Revelation, and, we, we, and so, but, but there's the general ideas. Either you read it chronologically, or you read it symbolically, um, and, um, and up to this period, all the way up into the 1800s, you, you kind of have now what's emerged two major camps with three, three schools of thought. You have what's the childist, but now it's being used because um, we've, we've more spoken Latin, especially the educated elite in Europe, and so mile is the Latin term for a thousand, and so the Latin translation of this thousand years is millennium, and so now we get the language of millennium. And up to this time, most people are premillennialists because they're reading the Revelation chronologically. They don't know what, quite what to do with it, and it's just kind of this strange speculative thing, but, you know, it's going to be something like this. Y you had, for a, a long period of time, the postmillennialist, which is saying there's there's going to be this thousand-year period where Christ is reigning, and it was usually understood that Christ is reigning spiritually through his church, that the millennium is kind of this symbolic thing. And, um, but, but then, you know, as the church began to recede, um, th there began to be the doubt that it's a literal thousand-year period. And, um, it, you know, and so there's these question marks. Um, but it became, Christ is going to come back after the millennium. So there's going to be a literal thousand years. And then post that thousand year period, Christ comes back. And we catch up with the rest of the story. And there's final judgment. And there you go. Now, in this time period, that's where you began to have this shift of some of the people. Instead of saying, I'm a post-millennialist, you began to have this thing of saying, a millennial. Now, technically, a means no, and you would assume that no millennium just says there's there's not going to be any thousand year reign. But technically, that's not what those people believe. They were in the camp that said this millennial kingdom is symbolic, and there's going to be Christ's first coming, and there's going to be Christ's second coming, and that when Christ comes the second time. He's not setting up a thousand-year kingdom on earth where he'll rule from his throne. No, no, that, that symbolized the church age. And we're not taking the thousand years as a literal thousand years. We're taking it symbolically of, 
of what describes between his first coming and his second coming. Now, during the Enlightenment, um, you know, and we kind of start the Age of Enlightenment back with Newton, and, um, you know, and at, at some point, you know, this move into the scientific era, rem you know, the, if, if you don't remember or didn't realize this, you know, I mean, the advancement of technology of the scientific revolution, um, the, you know, the beginning of the unlocking of being able to explain things using mathematics, which seems so mysterious, um, you know, we, we're, we're post the Renaissance we, we, we now have retrieved much of the information of the ancient world where, where the scholars are reading in Greek and Hebrew. And, but, but along with that, the, the practical engineering of the Middle Ages um, has now moved into the university and a more studied example of mathematics and theory and the exploration of creation. Remember that the first members and the first generation of the people in Enlightenment were all Christians, and they were exploring the Book of Nature, and 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 there is this sense that you know we, we are beginning to see things more clearly. The the lights are coming on. We we're we're, we're penetrating the dark. And that that so this description of this period is Enlightenment. Um. And one of the things that's happening during this period is a lot of things that used to be explained away as just miracles, now we're realizing there's naturalistic explanation. Um, and so, um, you know, and, you know, lightning and thunder, you know, is, is not anything to do with any sort of superstitions about, you know, gods, which were ancient Greek ways of explaining it. Um, and, and a lot of the mystery of what we would just say, well, that's just God's providence, and he's just upholding that. No, no, there's this at work, and, you know, Newton was huge because he was able to sit there and, and talk about some invisible force where we can predictably understand how things can fall, and we'll call it gravity, and look, everything is, is conforming to this. This is amazing stuff. Well, as that process moved forward and and the miraculous began to be reduced down to a smaller and smaller segment you started to have people who who didn't like the church wanted to get rid of the church along with a lot of the old structures of power that seemed abusive and and um, corrupt and and this begins this attack against the church um, and Christianity and, and the move towards skepticism and secularism and all of this stuff. And, and that's happening in the Enlightenment. And, and so now there's this look of saying, we need to re-examine the scriptures and we need to take it out of the superstition of um, these priests who just want to use um, these stories to incite fear for control. And, you know, so let's go back and let's reread. And, um, and so you began to have this movement um, in the 1700s. And by the time that you get to the early 1800s, there is deep skepticism. And a lot of what is coming out of the university is really an attack against Christianity and Christian orthodoxy and a calling into question about everything that we understand about Jesus Christian tradition and the Bible, and um, you know, and so you start getting these, you know, these theories about saying, you know, Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. Yeah, I mean that's that's a miracle, and we know that miracles don't happen. David Hume and his famous argument against the miracles. Um, if you've experienced anything in the common course of things that go against the common course of things, that's what a miracle is. But nothing ever goes against the common course of things, so of course miracles don't happen, and miracles are therefore impossible, and so nobody should believe in them. And, and so that, which is emerging in the 1700s, is taking place in the 1800s, and in the middle of the 1800s, the university is more of a place that is attacking the foundations of Christianity, um, 
than than supporting. And one of the things is if you're going um, as a pastor and and you're going to to be in a tradition where you go and you get a master's degree or and you study and you and you learn about the Bible and you go through this schooling process. Um, now what's coming is this the beginning that the seminary, this place of preparation for ministry, is becoming a place called a cemetery of spiritual death where people are losing their faith because they've been introduced to this new truth. And, and, and we know and we see and we understand very clearly and therefore we must reject. And, and the Gospels are not eyewitness testimonies as they purport to be because they have miracles in them and that only comes by legends. And so they... You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the theories that begin to emerge in the 1800s is that these were written, you know, 200 years after the fact. This isn't based upon any archaeological evidence. It isn't based upon anything that's supported by the historical record or tradition. It's all being based on the presuppositions that miracles are impossible. And therefore, that the, this has to be made up. Well, not everybody and not every Christian went along with this. Um, and some of them were quite bright. And, and so there began this academic debate. The majority were against the minority. Um, and you'll see this in America and you'll see this in Europe. And, um, and one of the things that you will find during this time is this move that, well... Really, and, and, and this was a very concerted thing, there was, there was a recognition that if we completely push off Christianity, we might go back into the moral chaos of the French Revolution and the Jacobean Revolt. And we can't just do away with all morality. That's too scary. So there's great moral truths that Jesus taught that, that seem to be the, the, uh, the epitome of, you know, the pinnacle of human moral understanding, at least some of it at least. So we want to hold on to, and this became the language of the 1800s, um, we want to hold on to the kernel of moral truth that, that's present within the Christian story. We just want to get rid of the husk of all the legend and myth. And the way forward for this was you, you began to take these things and um, uh, Frederick Schlaumacher, um, I think his name is Frederick, but his last name is Schlaumacher, um, is, is the father of modern Protestant thought. And it's this attempt to reinvent Christianity and the Christian story where the resurrection is not an actual historical event, but it's an idea and an ideal. It's coming awake spiritually, intellectually, morally. And, and you begin to get this separation of the way the world is and the spiritual truths. And, um, and so now we're going to start reading the Bible symbolically. And, um, and resurrection just becomes an ideal. Not, and, and, and then you're going to start getting these arguments coming in of, of sitting there and saying, well, you know, I mean, they didn't really believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Or if they did, it, you know, I mean, this was later legend where, where they were just trying to legitimize, you know, why we hold on to Jesus' teachings. And you get all of these sorts of things of different ways of trying to explain this. And, and that's the movement of, of the academy and the intelligentsia and the universities. But not everybody's going along with this, and, and, and there's this reaction. And part of what's going on is the way that you read Scripture. And you read it symbolically um, and, and figuratively. Well, guess what happens if you are a Bible-believing, orthodox uh, Christian who believes that Jesus really was raised from the dead, 
whenever anybody starts talking about reading the Bible symbolically, you're going to get suspicious. And the, the school of thought, which is dispensational premillennialism, emerges during this time where the underlying principle of it is, no, 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 you don't read the Bible symbolically. You don't read prophecy symbolically. Um, this is true. It's factual. We start getting the language of facts into this discussion, the language of science into this discussion. Um, if God said it, you can stand on it, and, and, it's, and, and you have to take it as literally as possible. Now, that begs the question a little bit. What is literal? Um, you know, because there, there is symbolism there. But, but, but this becomes the tension. And this is where now you end up getting two major camps with different schools of thought. Because in now the school where the thousand-year kingdom happens after Jesus comes back, but before final judgment and the end of the age... Now, there's not just what's historical premillennialism that can find roots in childism going back to the early church, but you have this different school of thought that, that says, no, 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 every promise of, in the Old Testament and every prophecy has to be literally fulfilled because this is about, you don't take things symbolically, and you take them as literally as you possibly can. And, um, and this creates a separation now in this camp. And, and the dispensational premillennialist has a much more involved explanation of both Old Testament prophecy and New Testament prophecy and the place and role of the millennial kingdom. And um, it's 958. And so we, we're, we're, I've kind of brought you up to a place where now we're kind of getting into the more modern schools, which is going to be the most helpful for us. And when we get together next Monday, we will, we will spend more time now kind of saying, here's how these different schools of thought exist today and their, their major thrust and idea and teaching. But I had some sort of question or comment. Prayer request. Prayer request. Gary Bush would like prayer for helping... Um, resolve a, m a multitude of medical conditions that may be related to his lack of thyroid function. And he's seeing a doctor tomorrow. Thanks, Gary, for sharing that. If you didn't hear that, Gary is experiencing um, a host of medical issues related to thyroid, and he has a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Um, but let's pray for him and us as we head into this day. Lord, thank you for Gary and... Um, Thank you, Lord, for his love for you. And thank you for um, his passion and desire to serve you. Um, Lord, as uh, he is experiencing health problems and issues um, that I am sure get in the way of, of just both the strength and, and what he's able to do, as well as just suffering in this, and then the threat that it has to his life. Uh, we pray for the doctor's appointment, we pray for the outcome, and we pray that there will be um, a simple solution. Uh, Lord, whether it's through the medical doctors or just through the power of your spirit, we pray for Gary for healing and strength, and that, um, that you would deal with this issue for him so that he might uh, not be um, de deterred or um, taken down but instead that he would be in a place where he could do your will. Uh, thank you, Lord, for Gary. We lift up uh, this day, and as we've kind of been given this history lesson, Lord, I want to give thanks. Uh, the, the church has not fallen. We, we can have dialogue with 2,000 years of Christian tradition um, that we can see and understand that while... On some of the details of the end, we may not always agree and may, we may not ultimately know for sure. Thank you that's what, what is most important is known. You will overcome. You have already defeated death and Satan. And we are putting our faith in you. So grow us up in Christ, we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. Thank you and have a great day. God bless.